may be seated. Y'all may be seated before I start acting up in here. Y'all may be seated. Y'all may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, man. I'm happy to see y'all. Y'all happy to see me? Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, for those of you guys who don't know, my name is Caleb. Um, I didn't get a chance to see, but if you're a first-time visitor, can you raise your hand for me? I just want to see you. Wow. Can we just make some noise for our first-time visitor? I just want to greet you guys. I'm so happy to see that you're here with us today. Our pastor needed a well, is on a well-needed sabbatical, um, so he's trusted me to preach the word today. So I promise, if you don't, <laughs> so it's okay. It's okay. Y'all don't got to do all that. <laughs> but if y'all don't like the word today, it's okay. We ask you to come back. Our real pastor is going to come and preach. I promise. I promise. I promise. He'll have something good for y'all today. So look, I don't got. I don't got that much introductions today. I really want to just dive right in. My wife and I did a lot of studying on this one, and so this is going to require a lot of help, honestly. So if y'all do me a favor, if y'all can just open your Bibles to John 11. John 11, we're going to be, this is where we're going to be studying. This is where we're going to be meditating. John 11. If you got it, you can say, I got it. If you don't, don't worry, it's going to be on the screen. I'm not waiting for you. Oh, I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That's going to that's gonna be ironic when you hear the title. But if you do me a favor, look at John 11. We're going to be reading from verses. We're going to be reading from verse 1. We're going to jump a little bit. And so if you have a question, we're going to read from the real Bible today, the New King James Version. So all those other versions, I don't know what you guys use, but we're reading from the real one today, all the counterfeits you can put away. So... We're going to go from John 11, starting at verse 1. And it reads like this. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord... Behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, when Jesus, lo now, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. If you do me a favor, jump down to verse 20. Jump down to verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. If you, if you do me a favor, go back to verse five and six. This is where we're gonna spend the majority of our time today. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now, in a, in a world that defines love by its responsive, reactive nature, this is a really interesting passage. It says that Jesus loved someone, yet he waited to help them. Yet he waited to save them. Now, now I'm not sure about y'all, but that creates some uneasiness in my heart. Because if Jesus is willing to act this way, it makes me question whether I want to be loved by Jesus at all. But I want to explore the tension in this passage today. And if you will allow me, I want to speak from the thought True love waits. True love waits. Every head bowed, all eyes closed. Father God, we, we come before you just acknowledging your presence. 
thanking you for another chance of life. Thanking you for another chance, Lord, to just be in your midst. And God, Lord, while I can acknowledge that I pen these words today, I believe that you were the primary author of this sermon. So I pray that you speak life into it. And I pray, Lord, that as you move in the room, that not only will I see you, but your people will see you. That your people will not only see you, but we will all embrace you and respond in worship. God, we give our hearts to you. We say this all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. True love waits. Now, some of y'all may not have experienced this, but back in the day when holiness was still right, (laughs) our parents used to send us to a magical place called a purity conference. Now, for those of you guys who've never experienced a a purity conference, it really was a magical place. It it, it taught us about celibacy. It taught you about purity. It taught you about dating, about marriage. Basically, it taught you all the things you listen to on your podcast today. And so, but the number one thing, the number one thing those purity conferences would teach us was the idea that true love waits. Now, y'all heard that before, haven't you? That, you know, if your boyfriend really loves you, then he wouldn't put you in a compromising position. If, if your girlfriend really loves you, that she wouldn't attempt to defile you. And they would say this mantra over and over and over again if, as if it was to be imprinted into our hearts. And if I'm to be honest, for, for a conference that had such a righteous cause, for many of us, it had a harmful effect. Right? It was harmful because it taught us that sex was a bad thing instead of a holy thing. It was harmful to some of us because it felt like it robbed us of owning our own sexuality. And I'm, I want to be clear, and for a, a conference, I should say, that was about purity, for a lot of us, it taught us a lot about shame. And I, I, I want to I put my cards early. This is not a sermon to encourage you in your celibacy or to redeem the idea of purity. I'm going to leave that to Pastor Craig and VJ for the marriage ministry, but I will say out of all the things that those conferences did wrong, I think it did one thing right, and that was teaching us that some things are worth waiting for. Some things are worth the wait, and I feel like this passage embodies this better than most. So if you do me a favor, we're going to walk through this passage verse by verse. So if you do me a favor, look at verse 1. We're going to start right there. Now it says this, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. The passage opens up by introducing us to a character we haven't met up to this point. Uh, In all the Gospels, Lazarus of Bethany hasn't been mentioned, so we don't know much about him. But we do know a lot about his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, now for those of you guys who don't know, Mary and Martha were devoted followers of Jesus. I, I would argue that there are few people in the scriptures that rival their devotion to Jesus. Like, every time Martha is mentioned in the Bible, she's either serving Jesus, feeding Jesus, hosting Jesus. Basically, her entire life is consumed with Jesus. And it's the, and it's the same thing for her sister Mary. Look what it says about Mary in verse 2. It says that it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. You see, Mary was another devoted follower of Jesus. She, she was a well-known follower. I'm, I'm talking about Mary was is so important in the scriptures that she's one of the first people that actually seen Jesus being resurrected. Mary was so close to Jesus that some people would argue that Mary understood Jesus' teachings better than the disciples themselves. And so this family is kind of a big deal. They're a big deal not only because of their devotion to Jesus, but what really makes them special is not that they love Jesus, but Jesus actually loved them. Now, I know that doesn't sound significant to somebody because you're like, well, Caleb, duh, Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves all the little children, all the children of the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, he loves everybody. But did you know that out of all the scriptures, this is one of the few places that highlights Jesus' personal love towards somebody? I'm I'm talking about even before his disciples, even before Peter, James, and John, it doesn't even say this. Now, to be fair, John is usually called Jesus' beloved, but John writes that about himself. 
So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little biased, you know what I'm saying? That's like, that's like me saying I'm Pastor B's favorite, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's kind of biased coming from me, you know? So, it, so I would say that it's this, this devotion that they had with Jesus was replicated by Jesus himself. Because I, I dare you to study, look at all the Gospels. It never really highlights Jesus' personal love towards somebody. So these were, these were Jesus' people. These were his homies. Now, I want you to imagine. I want you, could you imagine being best friends with Jesus? Like, go best friend, that's my best friend, Jesus? <laughs> like, like, you know how much clout I would have if Jesus was my best friend? Because y'all know how we treat our best friends, right? We're talking to them every day. We're hanging out with them. We're sharing TikToks with them. You know, because it, it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for someone to be your best friend. And we know that the most important thing in maintaining a friendship is reciprocity, right? Because I don't want to be pouring into somebody that's not pouring back into me. You know what I mean? Because we, we all know those friendships where you feel like you're the one who's doing all the work. Like, you're the one that got to hit them up all the time. You're the one who's always planning stuff to do. You're the one that's always checking in on them. And low-key, those type of friendships feel toxic. Because what good is a friendship? I, I heard you, sis. I heard you, sis. Because <laughs> what good is a friendship if I'm pouring into you and you're not pouring into me? What, what good is a friendship if you're not willing to help me in my time of need, in my time of desperation? So, so when I say that these people were Jesus' best friends, it's a big deal. That, that, that's significant. That's important. So, so let me paint this scene again. He, here's a family that's been devoted to Jesus. They've been serving Jesus. They've been sacrificing to Jesus. They love Jesus, and Jesus loves them. But this family has a problem. One of them has fallen ill. They've fallen deathly ill. Now, I can only imagine when Lazarus first got sick, Mary and Martha must have been concerned. They must have been in a state of panic because we know that diseases was a serious thing back then. It's not like they had the same resources that we have today. They didn't have the same doctors. They didn't have the same medicine. They didn't have ginger ale. You know, so, so, they, so, like, so when, someone, when someone got sick, they could really die. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it was a big deal. You know, because, you know, especially, you know, ginger ale really healed everything. Ginger ale will heal a broken leg if you got it. And so, like, it's a big deal that Lazarus is sick right now, and they're not sure what they're going to do. But I, I would wager, I would bet that after trying to nurse Lazarus to health, one of them had the idea was like, you know what? Let's hit our boy JC. Yo, let's hit up our boy JC. Like, yo, he just healed a blind man the other day. Like, yo, he just fed 5,000 people. I'm talking about, he just made a paralyzed man walk. If he can do all of this, what is this sickness to him? So he's like, yo, so resolving in their heart, they're like, yo, let's hit up our boy. We know he's going to pull up. So watch what they do. They decide to send word for him. And watch what they say in verse 3. Watch what they say. They say, therefore, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love. Look at them relying on that relationship. Look at them relying on that intimacy. They're saying, he whom you love is sick. Now, for a second, I need you all to clear your minds. I need you to clear your minds and pretend like you don't know the ending of the story. Imagine you're reading this for the first time. Because when I read this for the first time, I was getting hyped. I was like, oh, snap, these are Jesus' homegirls. Of course. Of course he's about to pull up. Of course he's going to do it. And then look what he says in verse 4. He says this. Now, Jesus heard it and said, this sickness is not on to death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified in it. So at, at this point, I'm like, okay, bet. Jesus said the man ain't going to die. Jesus just said that the man ain't going to die. It's actually going to be for the glory of God. And so even as a kid, when I saw the glory of God involved, I was like, oh, bet. It's going down. The glory of God is involved. God's about to pull something crazy. He's going to be like that man from the Montgomery video and swim to the thing. I'll be like, ah, ah, ah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's about, he's going to pull up. I'm anticipating that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a, there's a tension in the text that you're anticipating. You're feeling like Jesus is going to come through. Are y'all following me? And so you feel like, so watch it. Get yourself together. Get yourself together. Get yourself together. Y'all about to embarrass me in front of new folk. <laughs> now, now look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Now, now, it says this. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he rushed on the scene to help them. 
<laughs> now, there, there seems to be confusion here. There seems to be something weird. Like, if you're reading this for the first time, you got to interrogate this. You, you got to investigate this because it says Jesus loved them. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Like, th this can't make sense. Like, you, you have to understand that. Not only Jesus, did Jesus wait, but he waited on purpose. He waited. And Jesus, Jesus would wait so long that Lazarus' condition would get worse. He would wait so long that Lazarus' temperature would start rising, that his symptoms became more severe, that his body started to decay. Jesus would wait so long that Lazarus would die. Now, you got, you got to remember, you got to remember, this is a family that was devoted to Jesus. This is the family that loved Jesus. This is the family that had faith in Jesus. They had so much faith that they decided to send word to him. But, and so you would imagine that if anyone would be exempt from this type of pain, it would be this family. If anyone would be exempt from this type of suffering, it would be this family. But despite them calling on the name of Jesus, the situation got worse. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever been at a place where you've been praying to God about something, and after you pray to God about a situation, the situation gets worse. It's, it's okay. Y'all don't got to be honest with me today. That's why God lets me preach, because he knows I'll tell the truth. Because there's some things my wife and I are praying about right now, and it feels like the more we pray about it, the worse the situation gets. You're praying about God to give you a new job, and you lose your current job. You're praying to God about helping you in your relationships, and your relationships are starting to decay. You're praying to God to open doors for you and then you lose your home. You lose your apartment. You lose your car. You're praying and you're praying and you're praying, not realizing that you're in God's waiting room. <laughs> you, you, you've been in a waiting room before. Like, y'all been in a waiting room before, right? Like, my, my mom used to wake us up at the crack of dawn just to avoid the doctor's waiting room. We used to rush to get online, to put our names down, and then you will be stuck in a room like this. And you're seeing these little nasty kids coughing, sneezing, throwing up. It's mad disgusting. And you're just waiting, waiting, waiting for the doctor to call your name to get out of there. And isn't that how it feels with God? That you're stuck in a room like this. And you're watching people get healed before you. You're watching people get promotions before you. You're watching people get help before you, even though you've been here first. Even though you put your name down first, even though you've been saved longer, and you're waiting and you're waiting and waiting, hoping that God is going to call your name, but the call never comes. And you're waiting so much, and you're getting frustrated because sometimes the wait can be worse than the sickness itself. Sometimes the wait can be worse than the actual condition. And if we wait too long, many of us are, are willing to take desperate measures to get out of it. You, you see, Abraham and Sarah know about getting desperate. You see, when they saw that God had delayed in giving them a son, they decided that God needed their help to fulfill his promise. So Sarah goes to Abram with a, with a proposition. She goes with a proposal. And she's like, Abram, you know what? I think it's time for an open marriage. And I, and I know just the right lady who will, be, who will be down to be involved. And so all the husbands in your room, you got to imagine. You got to imagine Abram listening to Sarah's request. And just like, okay. And, and I wonder as he was listening, I wonder if he started to get desperate. I wonder if he started to question like, can God give me, really give me a son through Sarah? Can, can God really give me a son at all? Is he, does he even care enough? Has he even forgotten about his promise? But, and while we don't know what Abraham was thinking, what we do know is that in an attempt to honor his wife's request, he defiles his wife and sleeps with Hagar. And after defiling his wife, it brings them even more heartbreak and trouble than before. The children of Israel know about desperation. You see, when they saw that Moses was delaying from coming down to the mountain, they decided that it was time to take matters into their own hands. So they go to Aaron with a plea. They tell Aaron, like, Aaron, we don't know what happened to Moses and his God, but we need you to make gods of our own. We, we want to give you the gold that God gave us and make a golden calf out of it. Now, I want you to imagine, can you imagine using something that God gave you to defile God with it? See, y'all think I'm still talking about a golden calf. <laughs> y'all don't realize that God has given you your body, yet you're using it to, you know what? 
<laughs> but but here, here's the point. Here's the point I'm trying to say. They get so desperate that they tell Abraham that, you know what? The idol that you make for me, that's the reason we got delivered from Egypt. Not that God. <laughs> now, now, I know you're hearing this and you're like, no, that, that sounds crazy. I know you're hearing this. It's like, that, that sounds OD. That sounds unreasonable. Like, why would they do that? Why would they get so desperate to defile God like that? But you know about desperation too. When, when, when you saw that God is delaying giving you a spouse, you were like, let me pick one on my own. When you saw that God was delayed in answering your prayer, you are like, you know what, let me handle this on my own. Because the last thing any of us want to do is wait too long. The last thing any of us want to do is wait too long. But can I tell y'all something? Can I teach y'all what these um, passages are showing us about our waiting season? You see... God sometimes has us in a waiting season to show us what our idols are. Y'all not even listening to me. I said he has you in a waiting season to show you what your idols are, to show you the things you rely on for comfort before him, to show you the things you rely on for satisfaction before him, to show you the things that you value over him. You see, sometimes God will have you wait so long just to show you that those idols don't got any real power at all. You know, let, let, let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. God will sometimes strategically throw trouble at you just to bring you back to him. I know, I know, I know what I'm talking about because half of us wouldn't even be in this church if it wasn't for the pandemic. See, y'all not even listening to me. I said, if it wasn't for that last heartbreak you experienced, you wouldn't know to stop putting that, your trust into that person and start putting your trust on God. Because God has to show you that the alternatives ain't better than him. It ain't better than him. But, but let me get back to the text before Pastor Timmy gets mad at me. Can, 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 I, show the, can I show y'all the real reason God is, has you waiting? The number one reason, the reason that the text is showing you that he has you waiting. You see, God has you in a waiting season every time because he loves you. I know, I know you don't believe me, but look, look what it says in verse 5 and verse 6. Look what it says. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now, I, I know what you're thinking right now. I know, I know what you're, th you're, you're saying, Caleb, that doesn't make any sense. How, how can it be loving for God to wait to help them? This feels even more unloving. Because how can God claim to love Lazarus if he let him die? How can God claim to love Mary and Martha if he's allowing them to suffer? What kind of love is this? And I would agree with you. I, I would question that type of love. I would investigate that type of love. But I think it's important. I think it's crucial for us to remember that the Bible doesn't say that love is God, but it says that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. You see, and I know that sounds like the same thing, but it ain't. You see, because we can't allow our own fleshly characteristics of love to define God. We need God's holy characteristics to define what love is. C can I show you what I mean? Can I show you what it means in the text? Because Jesus said that this sickness is not on to death, but for the glory of God. He will later say in verse 15 that this sickness, Lazarus' situation, is to help everyone believe. It's to produce belief into them. So I want to play, now I want to play, a, I want to give you a scenario. I want to play a game. I want you to imagine if Jesus saved Lazarus in the nick of time. Imagine if he saved him. Imagine if he saved him right before Lazarus got sick. Imagine if he saved him right before the sickness took him. Now, now if we're playing this game, I got to ask you a question. Would it be more loving for Jesus to save Lazarus from a temporary death if it meant that everybody else had to experience an eternal death? <laughs> let, let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. Would it be more loving for Jesus to save one man or every man, woman, and child in that village? You see, this is the problem. You guys are too distracted by Lazarus' sickness, but the village is sick too. You see, the village is suffering from a sickness called unbelief. And Jesus is showing them that the death of one man can actually produce salvation for every man. See, let me not, let me, act, let me not get too ahead of myself. Let me not get too ahead of myself because this is the point. 
In our culture, we define love by its responsiveness, by its immediate resolve. But God is showing us that we can't interpret his love through our circumstance, but our circumstances should be interpreted by his love. Because sometimes true love waits. But if, but if we can be honest, waiting can be hard. Waiting can be difficult. And while we know the ending of this story, Martha doesn't. Martha, Martha doesn't know how this story ends. And, and watch how she responds being in God's waiting room. Jump down to verse 20. The Bible says this, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Let's take a break right there. You see, Jesus finally answers Martha's call. He, he finally gets to Bethany. In the moment that Martha hears that Jesus is on the scene, she rushes to his side. Like, overcome with emotion, Martha leaves her sister behind and rushes to the side of Jesus. Now, I, you got to remember, you got to remember, they've been waiting for Jesus for days. They've been, in, they've been attempting to keep their brother alive long enough just for Jesus to see them. But Jesus is late to the party. Jesus is late to the occasion. But I, I, I'm really blessed by Martha's interaction with Jesus because we can see that Martha is in a dilemma. Martha is in a dilemma because on one end, she's a devoted follower of Jesus. She served him for years, seen his miracles, believes in his ministry. Yet even though she's trying her hardest to hang on faith, her grief can't help but expose her disappointment. <laughs> Look what she says in verse 21. Look what she says. She says, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Martha finally sees Jesus face to face, and her first words to him is, you let me down. I, I believed in you, and you let me down. Now, I don't know. I, I don't know if anyone has ever been in a moment, in a place, where you felt like God let you down. Where you felt like God failed you when he was supposed to come through for you. You see, a lot of us here, if we're willing to be honest, we can resonate with Martha's words. Many of us have uttered the same words to God. But, but there's a portion of us, there's a portion of us in the room that's afraid to acknowledge our disappointment with God. We're, we're afraid to confront this feeling because we don't feel like God can do anything with it. We don't think God has, can, has an answer to our grief. And the truth of the matter is some of us would rather stay in denial than be honest with our confession. But, but if I understand the scriptures correctly, it, it was Martha's confession in her grief that allowed her to see a different side of Jesus, that allowed her to see a portion of Jesus she hadn't seen up to this point. You know, let, let me say it like this. Some of us haven't experienced the fullness of God because we won't allow God to experience the fullness of us. <laughs> let me say it one more time. Let me say it one more time. Y'all not listening to me. I said, some of us haven't experienced the fullness of God because we won't allow God to experience the fullness of us. If we were to be honest, you ain't happy all the time. You didn't enter this place with thanksgiving in your heart. You entered with a complaint because some of us are upset that God allowed us to be unemployed. Some of us are upset that God allowed us to see a divorce. Some of us are upset that God allowed some of our family members to pass away. And we're afraid to present these things to God because we don't think that God can do anything with it. We don't think that God can do anything with our pain. We don't think that God can do anything with our grief. And due, the, due to the fragility of our faith, many of us have chosen to remain silent. Silent in our grief. Silent in our pain. Silent in our despair. But can I tell you something? It's the trick of the enemy for you to be bound by silence. It's the trick of the enemy for you to be shackled up in your, in your condition. Because for many of us, our healing has a direct tie to our confession. Many of us have bottled things in our heart for so long because we have been mishandled by people and we think we'll be mishandled by God. But I want us to learn from Martha's example today that we can place our grief in the hands of Jesus. 
we can place our tears at the foot of Jesus because look what Jesus does to enter her grief. Pick me up on verse, 20, um, verse 21 again. It says, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, look at her trying to hold on to faith. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, I got to paint this scene for you because you have to remember it's been a couple of days since Lazarus had died. They, they've already had the funeral. Like they've already, if you look at the verses prior, they already had the funeral and the village people have been coming to comfort Martha and Mary. They've been trying to uplift them. They've been trying to encourage them. And you guys know how Christians are at funerals. You know, they, they go to a funeral and to, to the people who are mourning, they're like, don't be sad. You'll see them one day in heaven. Like, don't be upset. You'll see them in the suite by and by. Like, no need to be upset. But if anyone has experienced real grief like that, you know that's not comforting at all. <laughs> because the problem is not that I'll see them again. The problem is that I don't see them right now. So Martha is hearing Jesus' words, and he thinks, she thinks that Jesus is trying to comfort her the same way the people have been trying to comfort her. But Jesus is talking to Mary and says that Jesus is not trying to minimize Mary's, uh, Martha's pain. He's trying to enter in to Martha's pain. Jesus is talking to Martha and is like, no, you don't get what I'm saying. Like, you don't understand what I'm saying. You're, the thing that you're looking for is actually the person you're talking to. Jesus says to Martha that you're hoping for the resurrection. But verse 25 says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, now, you have to ask yourself, what does it mean for Jesus to be the resurrection? It means this. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, now here's the thing. This, this, this has to be one of the greatest claims of all scripture. For people who say to you that Jesus never claimed to be God, you got to point them to this. You got to point them to this and say, what does this mean? Because Jesus is saying anyone that death isn't a real threat to anyone who believes in me. For anyone who believes in Jesus, death will never have the final say. See, Jesus is telling Martha that death may have taken Lazarus, but I'm about to take Lazarus from death. He said, death may have robbed you from Lazarus, but I'm about to rob death and take Lazarus back. Now, I want to tell y'all that if, if this statement wasn't true, I couldn't be a Christian. If this statement right here doesn't prove to be true, I would have no reason to believe. Because you see, it's cute that Jesus can turn water into wine. It's even nice that he can feed 5,000 people. It's even better that he can heal. But if the power of life and death doesn't fall at his hands, you and I would have no hope. You and I would have no reason to believe. You see, Jesus is trying to tell Martha that, yes, you understand good doctrine. Yes, you understand godly principle, but I need to demonstrate to you God's power. He said, you're too filled up with biblical information. You need to experience the power of God. And I believe Jesus has the same desire for his church. Because I'll tell you this, I don't want to be a part of a church that just understands God's principles, but is absent of God's power. <laughs> you see, I don't want to, you see, too many of us are too comfortable hearing the word of God and not experiencing the word of God. <laughs> I, I want to tell you, there's a difference. There's a difference because I'm not a Christian because I heard a good sermon. I'm a Christian because I experience a good God. <laughs> now, Now, I, I need to be clear. I need to be clear before someone sends me an email because I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the value of good teaching. I'm not trying to diminish. I actually believe that in Epiphany, we have some of the best teaching in the world. Between Pastor B, Yolanda, Pastor Craig, Warner, even Andre, we have so many great teachers. But if all we do here is hear a nice word, but that word doesn't manifest in our lives, we missed it. We've missed the point. Because Jesus says that the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. And I'm not sure about y'all, but I'm tired of seeing people come through those doors bound and leave bound. 
<laughs> I'm not sure about I'm tired of seeing people walk through these doors shackled and leave shackled. There comes a point in time where people need to experience the power of God. You've, you've sat through too many services, read through too many devotionals, heard too many services, um, heard, heard too many sermons, but haven't encountered Jesus yet. <laughs> you see, D Dr. Eric Mason would say it like this. Good theology should be met with good experiences. You see, Jesus is trying to show Martha that I'm not trying to teach you something. I'm trying to show you something. It, it, the scriptures make it clear that Jesus wants to put his power on full display for everyone to see. Now, don't you want to see it? Don't you want to see how he does it? L look at verse 38. Look at verse 38. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha said, the sister of him who was dead said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he, had, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Now, around this portion of the sermon, I feel like I have a good idea what everyone's thinking. We approach a passage like this, a well-known passage like this about Lazarus being raised from the dead, and we're starting to contemplate the Lazarus in our own lives. We're starting to contemplate the dead dreams that God is trying to revive. We're starting to contemplate the dead relationship that God wants to rekindle. We're starting to contemplate the dead situations that God wants to breathe life into. And while I believe all those things are true, I want to bring us to the primary application of the text. Because in this story, Lazarus isn't your condition, but you're Lazarus. You see, you may not have realized it, but you've been sick for a long time now. You see, this, this isn't a sickness that the doctors diagnosed, but it was a sickness that you were born with. It was a sickness that was passed on to you at the point of your conception. You see, this sickness was so bad that it began rotting your body from the inside out. It was rotting your morals, rotting your values, rotting your identity, and most importantly, it was distancing you from your creator. This was a sickness called sin. It was a sickness called sin. And I know, and this, and many of us have tried to self-medicate this sickness on our own. We try to self-medicate it with our dreams. We try to self-medicate it with our goals. We try to self-medicate it with our relationships. And after trying our best to help ourselves, this sickness was still able to wrap itself around your heart to the point of death. I know you don't believe me. I know you don't believe me, but the Bible says we were all dead in our trespasses until Jesus came to the gravesite. <laughs> until Jesus came to the tombstone. And I know a lot of us think that, you know, we don't really need Jesus, but I ask you this, what can a dead man do to save himself? Can, can he resuscitate his own heart? Can he breathe life back into his own lungs? All of us were helpless against the tyranny of death until Jesus came on the scene. <laughs> and I, and I want to tell you all this, Jesus is coming to the gravestone and a lot of us have the same reaction that Martha has. But God, the stench of my sin is too much. Don't come near. God, God, the stench of my failure is too overwhelming. What can you do for me now? God, the stench of my trauma is too strong. What hope do I have now? Many of us have just grown tired of waiting for God to do something, and we just decided to live with it. We decided to live in our dysfunction. We decided to identify with our sin, and we've grown tired of waiting for something that might not happen. But can I tell y'all something? Jesus has been in God's waiting room before too. You see, Jesus, the same man who was loved by God, he, he, he was so loved by God that the heavens would open up for him. 
And, and it would open up so wide that the dove would descend on his shoulders. And you could hear the voice of God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased with. You see, Jesus was so loved by heaven that they would rejoice. The seraphim and the cherubim would just rejoice at the sound of his name. But despite this overwhelming, never-ending, relentless love of God, when the heavens saw that Jesus was being arrested, instead of saving him, God waited. <laughs> Y'all not listening to me right now. I said, when the heavens saw that Jesus was being beat and being bruised by the Pharisees, instead of saving him, God waited. <laughs> oh my God. Y'all not listening to me. I said, the wait got so bad that the situation got worse for Jesus. <laughs> it got so bad that they would put a cross on his back and he would start walking the path of Golgotha and be hung on a tree. Y'all gonna hear about the cross when I'm preaching. He, he got hung on a tree and the situation got so bad that Jesus himself got frustrated. Jesus himself will get frustrated and look on to heaven and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was almost like he was embodying the spirit of Martha and say, Lord, if you would have been here, I wouldn't have to be here. And then, goodness gracious, I don't want to get too excited. Now, heaven, now despite Jesus calling on the name of God, despite Jesus himself calling on the name of God, the heavens would remain silent. They will remain silent for so long that Friday night would pass and his, he would reap his last breath. Saturday morning would come and heaven lie dormant. That wait was so long that Saturday night would come and nothing happened. And I need to talk to somebody right now because I need to talk to someone who feels stuck on a Saturday. Who feels stuck in a place where God's not going to do anything. Who feels stuck in a place where you're between uh, God's promise and hopelessness. Where you feel like heaven doesn't have an answer to your situation. But I remind y'all that early Sunday morning heaven would have a response. <laughs> Good God. My God. I, I said early Sunday morning heaven would have a response to Jesus' situation. <laughs> You see, heaven will come down and descend on Jesus once again, and he will rise with all power in his hands. And he will look death in the faith and face and take everything back that death stole from him. You see, Jesus, God allowed Jesus to experience a taste of death, so you and I wouldn't have to experience a final death. <laughs> see, and I want to encourage someone today that Jesus is the ultimate example that those who wait on the Lord don't wait in vain. Jesus will be the ultimate example that the, our present suffering isn't to be compared to the glory that is to come. Jesus is the ultimate example that I am young and now that I'm old, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Jesus will be the ultimate example that I'll be pressed, but I'm not crushed. I'll be persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. I may be struck down, but I'm not destroyed. Jesus is the ultimate example that I may have scars in my hands, but the scars are proof that I survived. I want to show somebody right now that you may have scars on your body. You may have scars in your heart. You may have scars on your situation, but Jesus is proof that you survived. Oh my God, my God, my God. Jesus is proof that whatever came to overcome you, you overcame it. And Jesus will be the ultimate example that those that wait on the Lord, y'all should know this one, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount off like eagles and soar. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. I want to talk to someone that don't grow faint waiting on the Lord. <laughs> don't grow faint waiting on God. <laughs> don't grow faint faith waiting on the promise of God. I want to encourage somebody with good news that we got a good Savior who's working on your behalf. Every head bowed, all eyes closed. I'm done with y'all today. <laughs> Lord God, Lord, we just want to thank you. God, we just want to thank you. Lord, for if it was apart from your power, God, where would we be? God, if it was apart from your strength, where would we be? And I want to speak to someone who's still stuck at the gravesite today. I want to speak to someone who's still stuck behind the tomb. For many of us have been stuck so long, we don't feel like you have an answer to our situation. We've been stuck behind our family pain. We feel like you can't do anything with it. We feel like we've been stuck this way for so long. We don't have any hope to change. But God, I pray right now that you would change and turn around their situation. Father, I pray the same way you had a response for Jesus, have a response for us today. God, I pray right now that heaven will come down and move in this room, God. That they would have a taste of heaven and can feel the presence of God. Too many of us are too familiar with the presence of fear. 
We're so familiar with fear that we can see it, that it shapes our actions, that it shapes, Lord, our disposition. But let us be overcome with the presence of God. Let us be overcome with your overwhelming love, with your power and your strength, God. And I pray, Lord, that when we call on the name of Jesus, that our lives will never be the same. God, I pray, Lord, that you are able to treat us like Martha. For too many of us have heard a good word, but we haven't experienced you yet. Too many of us can memorize the Bible front and back, but we haven't seen Jesus face to face. God, will you show us your face today? God, will you show us your kindness today? God, will you show us your hand today, Father? I'm here today because your love lifted me. I'm here today, Lord, because your love was able to descend upon me and rise me, Lord, from the depth of my situation. God, I pray, Lord, that whatever is sinking, whatever situation is causing people to sink, God, I pray, Lord, that they remember that we serve a God that can walk on water, that can walk on water and lift them from the depths, God, of their situation. Father, I just pray this. Show yourself strong to your people. Show yourself mighty. And after you're done, let us worship you like never before. We say this all in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.